folks in into the game. So hopefully I will start to watch that participant line rise. There we go. So for those of you joining the call um, or the Zoom, um, we're gonna just wait a few minutes as we let folks get into and get settled in, in our Zoom space. Um, and we'll start here in probably two or three minutes. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We are so delighted to be here with you um, this after or this evening, along with um, novelist Larry Watson for his book, The Lives of Edie Pritchard. Uh, just before we get started, a couple notes of housekeeping. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Zoom this time around. Um, we are so grateful for the support of our community um, and the support of Books in Common and all of the authors that have joined us so far um, that have really made this uh, discussion series a success. Um, we are recording this event and it will be viewable on um, the Books in Common Northwest.com webpage as uh, soon as we can get it downloaded and uploaded as it were. Um, so if you have to leave early, do, don't worry. Uh, we'll have this recorded and available um, after the event. We're delighted to be here in this virtual space with our Books in Common partners, Madison Books in Seattle and Polina Springs in um, Sisters, Oregon. And before we get to hear more about the lives of Edie Pritchard from Larry, we wanted to point out a few things about this virtual space. First, I just dropped a buy link into the chat section um, and I'll periodically just copy and paste that for folks that are um, joining us as we go along this, this evening. Um, but do give that a click so you can show your support for Larry and Books in Common by purchasing your book from one of our sponsoring stores. If you have questions for Larry, you, there is an ask a question button um, either at the top or the bottom, depending on how you have your screen um, set up, but it'll be, and it says Q&A. Uh, so please uh, uh, drop your questions there as we go through the discussion today. Um, and we'll get to them at the end as time allows. Um, 
If you run into tech issues, we recommend either refreshing your browser or um, leaving the meeting and coming back if you're using one of the apps. Um, you can also switch um, to headphones if you're having troubles hearing um, with volume issues and those kinds of things. We do want to remind you that this is a shared creative space and so we would ask that everyone um, remain safe and respectful of everyone that's joined us tonight. Um, offensive comments or questions will see the user dismissed from this space. Um, we are so delighted to be sharing this space this evening with Larry Watson, um, born from nor in North Dakota and currently beaming to us through sat via the internet from Wisconsin. Um, Larry's the author of several well-acclaimed novels, including um, Montana 1980, or excuse me, 1948. We just have a little dyslexic moment there um, for those of you coming to us from Montana. Um, as well as several short story collections and poetry collections. Um, Watson's taught writing and literature at the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point for 25 years, um, as well as several other writing conferences across the West. Um, he is a big fan and a big supporter of us here in Bozeman. Um, and so we are absolutely delighted to learn more about ED, the lives of Edie Pritchard. Um, Larry, if you wanna take it away. Sure. Oh, thank you very much. I, you know, one of the things I've realized through the Zoom events is that you, you always say something having to do with place. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming here. And so now it's, I don't know what, time. We're, we're together in time, not in space. Yeah. But are we in three different time zones? I think we are. We are, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I'm uh, see, referring to my notes here. Hold up book. I am the <laughs> author of The Lives of Edie Pritchard. Uh, it was just published on July 21st. Uh, it's my 12th book, my, my 10th novel. Uh, my first novel came out in 1980, so I've had 40 years uh, at often generally, generously spaced intervals of experiences with the world of publishing. I've been with six different publishing houses and at least as many editors. I've also had five different literary agents but I've been married for 53 years, so I'm, I'm able to sustain a relationship. Um, so I don't know if that I've gained any special wisdom about the world of publishing, but I'd be happy to talk about my experiences if anyone has an interest in that. And I also have some experience, and some of it is very recent, with um, having my fiction adapted for the movies. Over the years, a number of my novels have been optioned for film, and one of my books finally survived that process from product, from project to finished product, uh, and that's Let Him Go. Um, it was written and directed by Tom Bazooka. It stars Diane Lane, Kevin Costner, and Leslie Manville. It was scheduled for general release in August, but Focus Features has now postponed it until November 6, I believe. Uh, my wife and I visited the set in Canada last year and um, got to watch the, some of the filming and uh, fascinating process. It's a business for patient people. Uh, we've also seen the finished movie. The director arranged for a link to be sent to us for our viewing and we love the film. Um, and I'm not just saying that because we appear in the fancy restaurant scene. Uh, really, it's a terrific film. So uh, all of this is just to say that though I've prepared some remarks on a topic, I'm, I'm happy to talk about any subject you have in mind. Just let me know with your questions. Um, back when I taught school, once a month we would have Ask Larry Watson anything day. So <laughs> this is gonna be Ask Larry Watson anything day. Uh, but I thought what I'd do this evening is to discuss my writing process or at least part of it. And the part of it 
that has to do with something that might move from an experience out there, that is in the observable world we all live in, to my mind and from there to the page. And I'm going to use an incident in the lives of Edie Pritchard to illustrate that process. Um, uh, first, a brief outline of the book. Uh, it's uh, The Lives of Edie Pritchard is, is three novella-sized stories, and these take place at 20-year intervals. And though each story has elements that appear in or parallel elements in the other, they're all somewhat self-contained. But at the heart of each section is Edie Pritchard. So we see her in 1967, 1987, and in 2007. So we see her when she's 24, 44, and 64. And I've tried to show how she changes over time, uh, but also, and this was just as important to me, uh, how certain features of Edie's character and personality remain constant over time. Uh, there's a particular complication and conflict in Edie's life that also doesn't change. And that's her struggle to define herself rather than be defined by others, to be seen as a whole person and not simply as, as the beautiful girl. Uh, men especially, but not exclusively, want to project on her an identity that suits their needs rather than hers. Uh, Edie was born and raised in Gladstone, Montana, and the novel's first section 1967 section, finds her there, married to Dean Linderman, her high school boyfriend. Dean has a twin brother, Roy, and Roy is Dean's opposite in many respects. Roy is a smooth-talking womanizer, an extrovert, and he's been pursuing Edie in one manner or another since high school. Uh, inevitably, the brothers fight over Edie. They also fight to impress Edie. In the second section, the 1987 section, Edie has split from Dean and from his brother, and she's remarried. Um, she's still living in Montana, but far from her hometown of Gladstone. A phone call from someone in Edie's past arouses a violent, jealous response in her husband, and Edie leaves, and she takes her teenage daughter with her. In the third section, Edie's back in Gladstone, she's living alone, she's no longer married, and she seems content with her life. But again, a phone call rouses Edie from her quiet life, and this time it's Edie's granddaughter who's in trouble. She's been traveling the country with a pair of outlaw brothers, and she asks Edie to come to her rescue. Uh, so that's a, that's a brief overview. Um, I should say I'm not an especially autobiographical writer, but I will sometimes take a detail from life, sometimes from my own experience, sometimes an observation, as a way into a story or a scene, something that I, I feel I know and that will provide authenticity and believability to the fiction, and maybe also allow me to make use of an emotion from life that can be transferred to the story. For example, here's a, here's a quick autobiographical detail. Um, I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota. I had an uncle there who occasionally traveled to small towns in North and South Dakota to buy cars and trucks. That wasn't his job. He worked for an insurance company. But as a sideline, he liked to see if he could get a good deal on used vehicles. And he didn't keep them, but he brought them back to Bismarck for a friend of his to sell on his used car lot. And I rode with my uncle on a few of those expeditions in order to drive one of the cars back. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now I'm gonna read from the novel. I'll read the novel's opening scene. And again, the action here takes place in 1967. Roy Linderman and Edie Linderman, she's married to Dean's twin brother, to Roy's twin brother, Dean, are on the road driving from Gladstone up to Bent Rock, Montana, where Roy plans to purchase a truck. And Edie is riding along to drive Roy's car back home. Each of the novel's three section 
it's features a road trip and sometimes more than one. And this is the first. Sunlight glints off the sunlight glints off the slope of the hood like a snowdrift, and Roy Linderman puts on his sunglasses. Like a man born to drive, he lets one arm hang out the window of his Chevy Impala, while the other rests on top of the steering wheel to keep the big car in line. The air flowing through the car is as hot as the August wind blowing across the prairie, and to make himself heard above the rush and the steady rumble of the Chevy, Roy raises his voice. How do you know it isn't the flu, he asks. Maybe we'll all get it. My aunt in Bozeman is a nurse, Edie says, and she says it's almost always something people ate. And what makes you so sure it was the hot dog? Please. Sitting in that greasy water all day, it was the hot dog. And you didn't eat one, so you're safe? That's right, Edie says, I'm safe. When we were kids, Roy says, whatever was going around, he got measles, mumps, chicken pox, like maybe with twins, only one of us had to get it, and Dean would be the one, and it had passed me by. Strep throat, tonsillitis, he had his tonsils out, and I still got mine. I remember when he had strep, Edie says. She gives her head a rueful little shake. I remember that very well. I wonder if maybe you did, Roy says. On every side of them, nothing hot rises more than knee high, and the wheat grass, needle grass, blue grama, and fescue all the color of a sweat-stained straw hat bend down lower in the direction they're always bent, west to east. What are we going after again, Edie asks. It's a 1951 GMC half ton, low miles. How did you find out about it? It's Les Moore's uncle's. The uncle had to sell his ranch so he doesn't need the truck. Doesn't anyone else want it? Hell yes, but we'll get there first. Ahead, a dust cloud, high and thick enough to tint a corner of the sky, a darker blue swirls, and well before they draw close, they can taste its dirt. The hell, Roy says, someone's plowing something, close the windows. They both crank up their windows, then Edie crawls over the seat to get to the rear windows. She has to swing one bare leg, then the other past Roy's head, and he takes his eyes off the road to watch her make this climb. Stay back there, he says. You can roll them down again in a minute. As the windows close, the air changes pitch from a steady whoosh to a fast-paced thump as if a propeller powered their vehicle. Then the interior suddenly quiets and their voices lower as though they've entered a church. My God, Edie says and draws a deep breath. It's like the inside of an oven. I'm never getting a car again without air conditioning, Roy says. I swear it. Edie keeps one hand on the window crank. Your place gets plenty warm, doesn't it, says Roy. I told Dean, anytime you two need a good night's sleep, come on over and you can have my bedroom. Air-conditioned comfort, you can't beat it for sleeping. And turn you out of your bed, where would you sleep? I can always find some place to bunk down. I bet you can. Or maybe you want your own unit. If the store has any left at the end of the season, they always put them on big sale. I could use my discount and get you an even better price. We'll let you know. Talk it over with Dean, Roy says, then twists his head as though he needs to know exactly where she is in the back seat. We'll let you know. In another minute, the sky clears back to its undifferentiated blue. Roy says, you can roll them back down and get back up here. I'm not your chauffeur. The truth is, Edie would rather remain in the back seat, out of Roy's reach. These brothers, for some time now, Dean has acted as though he's been warned to keep his hands off her. Even in bed, he sleeps on a narrow space away from her. Meanwhile, Roy has been, well, Roy. Could it be the desire is something like mumps or measles, one brother coming down with it while it passes the other by? Edie points a finger straight ahead. Take me to the theater, my good man. And I'm sure as hell not your good man. As Edie climbs over the seat again, Roy reaches out a hand, but whatever he was going to do, he must think better of it because he puts his hand back on the steering wheel. Once she settles back into her seat, however, he takes his hat from where it's been resting in the space between them and tosses it into the back. Roy asks, you ever been up to Bent Rock? When I was a little girl, Edie says, my dad took us up to Canada, just drove across the border and turned around and came back again so we could say we'd been there. 
Would we have gone through Bent Rock then? You might have. Then I might have been there. Well, whatever you remember, it hasn't changed since. Edie slips off her flimsy rubber sandals and hooks her toes up on the lip of the dashboard. You'll probably get your feet dirty today, Roy says. I don't think Bent Rock's got but the one paved street. I thought I'd wait in the car. Hell no, I need you to keep him distracted during the negotiations. Really? What was Dean's job going to be? Drive, that's all, just drive. Roy takes a pack of camels from the pocket of his white shirt and shakes a cigarette up to his lips. He offers the pack to Edie, then pulls it back. I forgot, you don't smoke. He pushes in the lighter. A moment later, it pops out and he presses its glowing coils to his cigarette. He inhales deeply and when he exhales, the wind whips the stream of smoke out the window. Don't you have any vices, Edie? You know better than to ask me that. Roy turns his head toward her and with his finger slowly traces in the air the length of Edie's bare leg. Tell me something, he says. How do you get so tan working in the bank all day? Edie quickly lowers both feet to the floor. She says, we've got a folding chair we set up behind the building. During breaks and lunch hour, I sit back there. And I'm out on weekends, of course. I wouldn't think you'd get much sun in that alley. Roy pinches his cigarette between his lips and extends both arms. Me, I'm like a steak cooked on just one side. The car floats over the center line and Edie starts to reach for the steering wheel, but then Roy takes hold of it once again. About the only time I get out of the store, he says, it's in the car, and then one arm hangs out the window and the other doesn't get any sun at all. The only other car visible on this stretch of highway is at least a couple miles ahead and then it vanishes curving its way into the first of a series of low hills, each stitched to the next with a narrow dark strip of cottonwood or burr oak. Now you, Roy says, you probably have to hike your skirt up plenty high to get so much sun. He leans forward to look at her and maybe undo a button or two. She doesn't say anything. Of course, with those mini skirts you've taken to worry, oh, for God's sake, Roy, can't we have a normal conversation? Roy smiles the smile of a man confident of its power to heal or beguile. Why sure, Edie, what did you want to talk about? But she says nothing and turns her head away from her brother-in-law. She knows women whose husbands would never let their wives get into the car with Roy Linderman, but not Dean. No, not Dean. Um, so I'll just also say that um, on that trip, there's a serious accident, and that accident alters the trajectory of many lives. Uh, I've said on occasion that I'm a writer who relies more on memory than observation. And uh, here's a, an example, kind of a crude example of what I mean. If I'm describing the landscape of eastern Montana, the setting for a few of my novels. I don't go to Montana, study the landscape, take notes, and then transfer those observations to my fiction. I describe the landscape as I remember it, and I trust that my memory will serve as a useful filter. That is, details that are significant and meaningful, even if I don't know how they're significant or what they might mean, will stick in the filter, waiting for me to make use of them. So going back to those excursions, I made with my uncle. In the summer of 1966 or 1967, I took one of those trips and my girlfriend, soon to be my wife, rode with me. With my uncle, we traveled to a small town in South Dakota and we came back in a newly purchased but not new pickup, which I drove and my girlfriend rode with me. The trip was totally uneventful no accident, no dust storm, no revelations of character or emotion, but I remembered. I can remember very distinctly a view of the grassy hills we drove through. And I drew on that memory and the images stuck in the filter in creating that scene that I just read. Except, this is a big except, except my wife has no memory of this trip at all. <laughs> And, and for that reason, I've begun questioning my memory. Why, for example, would she and I have driven the newly purchased truck? Why wouldn't we have driven my uncle's car? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, but here's the thing, or it's a thing. It doesn't matter to the fiction. 
I said I write more from memory than observation, but I suspect what I actually rely on is something that might be called, this is my own word, imagination. A memory supplemented or enhanced by the imagination, or maybe a memory totally created by the imagination and then mistakenly stored in the compartment that's usually reserved for memories of real experiences. And so the resulting memory is false. That is, it, it wouldn't be or shouldn't be admissible in a court of law, shouldn't be used to settle a wager or to make a point in a family dispute, though memories of this kind are used in those situations all the time. Uh, I've sometimes said, beware of those people whose memories are a little too good. They might be, those memories might be products of an imagination. But I'm not going to argue that my, my memory of that trip to South Dakota is true. I'm willing to go along with what my wife remembers, or in this case, doesn't remember. I could argue, however, that the memory provided something true for the fiction, and that's all I need. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and, I'll, and see if there are any questions on Ask Larry Watson any <laughs> evening. Well, I don't see that any questions have rolled in yet. So while I give everyone a chance to think of their question, um, I had a couple of my own. Sure. Um, the first being, where did Edie come from? Because um, obviously that she can't be autobiographical. <laughs> no, um, no, she's not. Um, um, she's a product of my imagination, but also probably a lot of years of experiences. I've never, uh, she's a strong woman. And I've said that um, I've had no shortages, shortage of examples of of strong women in my life. I, I uh, mentioned in my acknowledgments for uh, this novel that my wife was willing to serve as the, as the template for Edie Pritchard, which is not to say that she has had any of the experiences that Edie had, but I, I, I felt as though I could say, okay, in this situation, is it plausible, possible, plausible that Susan might, my wife, might act in a certain way that I'm thinking about having Edie act in that way? And if my answer was yes, I felt as though I could go ahead with it. Uh, but I probably, you know, um, sure, it, it, it's not autobiographical, but um, there are things that are in Edie that are in me. I think men and women are different, but they're also the same in many ways. Yeah. Um, I was curious because Gladstone is also a location in Montana, 1948. Um, if she had any lineage back to your previous works. Um, you know, at some point, I, um, I've been using some of these different Montana locations in a number of books. So um, there's a little nod to Montana 1948 injustice in this book when I mentioned Bent Rock and Gladstone has appeared in other books most recently in, in As Good As Gone. Um, these are imaginary locations that are informed by reality. And I guess that, you know, once you go to the trouble of creating these places, you make use of the, you know, it's like, okay, the, the, the set has been built, I might as well make use of it. And, uh, but also there's an advantage when you write about these places that you know because you've created them. Uh, it, it sort of frees your imagination because you don't have to make up everything having to do with the streets and the, and, and I've said where the Dairy Queen is and, and where the courthouse is um, because you've already established those at least in your own mind. Thank you. 
Um, one of our question, our audience question, audience questions is, do you have a usual location, ritual, headspace that you often go to for inspiration? Or is there no telling where a good idea might pop into your head? Um, no, there's no telling. There's no telling. Um, um, I usually write at home at my desk in my office, but um, I, you know, I don't have rituals that I have to follow. I don't have to sharpen 20 pencils. I don't have to have a cup of Earl Grey tea. He pauses to drink from a cup of Earl Grey tea. Um, <laughs> um, no, I can, I can, some places are, are better than others, but that mostly has to do with physical comfort. I can write um, any place, any, any time. James asks, if you're a writer of memory, how long do you have to live in a place before writing about it? And do you consider yourself a North Dakotan writer, a Montana writer, or a wooden sorry, Wisconsinian writer? Um, I, well, I, um, I've lived in Wisconsin longer than I lived in North Dakota, but I, I you know, North Dakota is where I'm from. So I'll, I'll, I'll always be a North Dakotan in some important way. Uh, how long do I have to have lived in a place? Um, well, my wife says that I don't write about a place until we leave it. <laughs> so, so, um, um, so for example, we live in Kenosha, Wisconsin uh, right now it's not likely that I'm going to write about Kenosha because we're living there, but I've left Milwaukee, so it's possible that Milwaukee could show up in, in my fiction. But really, the, the, the further back in time locations are, for some reason, um, um, better for my imagination. I'm more likely to write about those. Let's see here. Um, how did you divide your time between writing and having a full-time teaching position? This is a question from Fern. Um, well, it wasn't, I, um, I, I can't say that I had a system. I mean, I, I just made sure that I wrote every day. I, I mean, uh, as long as I was teaching, teaching always had to come first because those are the people that you that you face every day, and um, uh, but I made sure, uh, and I still do. I just made sure that I did some writing every day, and and almost always that writing was uh, working on a novel. And um, after a few years, I uh, when I moved to Milwaukee and started teaching at Marquette, I had a lighter teaching load. And so that division of time was a little easier. I'm retired now. You'd think that I'd uh, be tremendously productive. I'm not. I think one of the things that happens when you're, when I was teaching and trying to write is, is that I was more efficient with my, with my time. And now mm -hmm. it feels as though I've got all this time. And if I don't get to it for another hour or so, that's okay. Let's see. Um, uh, another question, why do you think that it, that it is that the further back something is or the more likely is the more likely you are to write about it? More room for imagination or a longing to revisit that time or area? I don't see why I have to answer that question since it was just answered in the question. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think both of those things are exactly true. I think it is a way to recreate a past um, and to go back to a time that um, that perhaps you don't know as well as you would like to. Um, sure, absolutely. You know, uh, I, I agree with the what the questioner said. <laughs> um, James is looking forward to hear, would love to hear more about the movie making process. Um, it seems like he loved the dynamic between the married couple in Let Him Go and is delighted that Hollywood is fond of the book um, and is also curious if you can talk about that relationship. Um, sure. Um, 
uh, it really comes through well on the screen, in my opinion. Um, uh, uh, Kevin Costner and Diane Lane just have a really uh, a, a kind of ease of about them that seems consistent with people who have been married for a long time. Uh, even when they start to have a quarrel, it, it feels as if it's something that they cut short because they know that they've been over this before. Um, their conversations go a little ways, but then they sort of stop because they know the other so well. And um, the, the, the director of the film, Tom Bazooka, uh, also wrote the screenplay. And uh, I, I just thought he did a, a terrific job of of capturing of capturing those things. What was the adaptation process like for that? Were you able to work with it with um, Tom Bazooka on adapting it for the screenplay? Did you give him notes or completely hands off? Uh, it was mostly hands off. Uh, he and I had some conversations early on before he had before the uh, the book's rights had been had been optioned or purchased uh, when he was simply interested in it and um, I enjoyed those conversations a lot. I mean I liked what his take was on the the book and it um, the resulting film is is a fulfillment of his vision. I mean, it's a different medium, you know. I mean, I, at at one point, he said, and we we talked a bit over the years. He he said something about he said, Larry, I had to I had to sort of collapse those two scenes. Uh, I couldn't have them go over to the gas station because I didn't want to build another set. <laughs> and then I thought, oh my God, if novelists ever got it easy. I mean, they, I just say, and they pulled into the gas station, you know. Um, so, uh, it, and the movie also has a really good look. One of the things that's different in the book than in the novel is in the novel, they start in North Dakota and go to Montana. And in the film, they start in, in Montana and that's where their home is and they go to North Dakota. Um, but the film has a really good look uh, as well. Wonderful. Um, speaking of North Dakota, another question is if you have recommendations for books or authors out of North Dakota. Um, sure, yeah. Um, uh, well, one of the, uh, uh, my favorite writers uh, who is from North Dakota and her, her most recent novel uh, is, is set there and that's uh, Louise Erdrich. And uh, she's just, uh, I mean, one novel after another is just wonderful. And um, her latest is The Night Watchman. It's set in North Dakota. Um, it, it's, just, it's just terrific. Um, another writer that I'll mention that I think it writes so wonderfully about North Dakota, uh, it's been a few years now since he's had a novel or a book of short stories, and that's Larry Wywitty. Um, uh, yeah, those are a couple of North Dakota writers. I, I, I admire both of them very much. Um, since uh, the lives of Edie Pritchard kind of circling back jumps every 20 years or so, and we get these glimpses or vignettes into um, Edie's life at different times. Did you imagine what 80 year old Edie would be doing? Um, Joanna's curious, does the book lend itself to another vignette in 2027? Not yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it seemed closed off to me with with um, the, the events of 2007. Um, but never say never. Uh, I mean, when I started this novel, I thought the first section, the 1967-1968 section, I thought that would be the novel. Um, but when I came to the end of that, I knew that there was just more there, and when I say more, I'm mostly talking about Edie's character. I mean, there was just a complexity and a depth there um, that I wanted to keep exploring. And so I thought, well, a, 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 another chapter in her life. And so the same thing happened. I finished the 1987 section, and by then I'd sort of understood that there was a momentum there that that um, was sort of apart from any plans that I might have had. And um, 
and so another 20 year interval just seemed seemed logical 2027 we can only hope but i don't know <laughs> Um, one of the things that struck me uh, in reading The Lives of Beauty Pritchard was um, these sort of generational patterns that follow people and families. And I was curious um, if you were swept up in the pull of those generational patterns and if they followed you the way they followed Edie, um, and if you ran from them the way Edie sometimes ran from them, or if you chose to sort of break through them. Um... Yeah, um, I can't think of any, any uh, parallels in my own life, uh, but maybe someday if I ever end up in therapy, maybe I'll be able to discover them. <laughs> uh, but one of, the things that I, one of the things that I did know about fairly early on was the business about twins and uh, not just the literal twins, but some, some sort of twinning in terms of events and characters. So there are literal twins in the first section. There are brothers in the second section. There are events that sort of parallel, parallel each other. And then certainly the road trips are something that keep occurring or recurring in Edie's life. So I, th I think those came up because the material was trying to tell me something. And I, when it seems to me that's happening, I follow those paths, even if I don't know quite where they're going or what they're all about. Thank you. Um, I was curious if you would also share um, some of your process for writing about the male gaze like this is a thing that Edie is struggling with a lot yeah. um, and I was curious if you could sort of discuss some of that and, and what your process was for exploring that um, if that was just a lot of conversations with your wife or um, how that worked for you um, sure conversations with my wife living with my wife she's an attractive woman i mean i knew what was going on over the years um but also in it's it's in our culture i, I mean <laughs> we um we just know about that i think or at least i i i hope we do and um and something happened very early on in the book um at the same time that Roy and Edie are in the car together, her husband is back and in um, their apartment. And he takes down um, a, a, a high school yearbook and he looks at Edie's image. And I thought, isn't that, that's sort of strange, isn't it? I mean, that he's looking at an image of her, um, but it has to do, I think, with, with something that maybe that he can control and um, so that's that's definitely a part of it. And then uh, it, it occurs at other points in the book too, where where she's being looked at and and uh, or looked at in a certain way that leads to an identity that she doesn't particularly own. Yeah, I really appreciated the way that you framed that um, in the second section in 1987 when she's sharing about um, watching home movies with um, the people in her life at that time. And the way that she, Edie reckon, is reckoning sort of consistently and continuously with the same thing, um, I thought was really interesting. Good, thank you, yeah. Um, one of my counterparts says, Larry, you've gotten rave reviews for this novel. Do you read your reviews? Also, what are your thoughts on being referred to as a regional writer? Um, yeah, I read my reviews. <laughs> um, I, uh, yes, I do read my reviews. Yeah. Um, and if they're good, I discount them. But if they're bad, I think, oh yeah, I've been found out. <laughs> They're sort of like student evaluations, you know. Um, 
you get a, you get a bunch of good student evaluations and you say, sure, I fooled them this time. And, and then if you get a bad one, you say, oh, I've been found out. Um, but yes, I do read my, uh, I do read my reviews. And uh, the regional writer thing, um, I don't object to it. Uh, um, I do write about a region. Um, you mentioned the North Dakota, Montana. I've also had a novel set in Minnesota and Wisconsin. I think it, that I sort of write northers, you know, across that that strip of country, that far north. Um, but of course, there's no such thing as a norther. I mean, so it's much easier to call somebody a writer of westerns or something. Um, no, I don't object to it. I do wish, however, that. Um, somebody who always sets his or her novels in Manhattan would also be called a regional writer. And because it's certainly true, I think, um, yeah, we're all regional writers. And yet people from some regions are more likely to get tagged with that than other regions. But no, I don't object to it. It's flattering in a way. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh... Let's see, I'm just gonna check to see if we have any other questions or comments. Um, feel free to jump in anyone. It is Ask Larry any, Anything. That's right. <laughs> favorite color? Blue. Is Earl Grey your favorite tea? I wouldn't say it's my favorite tea, but I would say it's one of my favorite teas. <laughs> Um, if Edie was in the audience tonight, what would you want Edie to know? Um, uh, hey, Edie, um, we'd like to hear from you and we're going to try to let you be yourself. Uh, we did get another question. Has lockdown had an impact on any current projects or your writing process? No, no, it hasn't. Um, no, it's, it's not something, what's happening in the world is not something that I've written about. I doubt that I will write about it, but again, never say never. Um, no, I, you know, um, uh, my wife and I live lives that are very similar to the lives we lived before. The crazy, awful times began and, um, so no, the, the, the rhythm of my life hasn't changed significantly. The emotions that go along with it are sometimes unexpected and extreme. Grief, rage, disappointment, yeah. But I'm still, I, you know, I'm able to write every day and um, yeah. Well, I'm sure we've all been um, admiring the books behind you. And I'm curious, what are you reading right now? Uh, what am I reading right now? I'm reading uh, a collection of short stories by uh, James Salter called Dusk. Um, I just finished uh, Colson Whitehead's The Knuckle Boys, and it just blew me away. And it was just magnificent. Um, I'm reading a book. Um, called Something Wonderful about Rogers and Hammerstein. Um, so those are three things I've got going right now. Wonderful. Um, Joanne is curious if you're visiting Bozeman or um, if you live someplace else. Um, I've never lived in Bozeman as I, uh, we were talking earlier. Um, and uh, I visited Bozeman often as a child when uh, um, uh, I had an aunt who lived there, and so we often drove from Bismarck to Bozeman every summer. And my wife and I have been in Bozeman a few times over the years for sometimes for events and workshops and other times to visit old friends. But now you're in Madison, correct? Or er, oh, in Wisconsin? In Wisconsin, that's right. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is right between uh, Milwaukee and Chicago and right on Lake Michigan. Wonderful. Well, if no one has any further questions, type furiously. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to drop the link to purchase your copy of Edie Pritchard or any other of Larry's wonderful books uh, in the chat again. Um, oops. So that you can pick your favorite Books in Common bookstore to support. Um, we are happy to get you all of Larry's books. If you just need all of them, um, see if you can track down everyone, all the places and things that Larry has written about. Um, thank you so much, Larry, for joining us this evening. It was an absolute delight. Um, You're welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's here, there. Yes. <laughs> tonight. Wonderful. All right, friends. Well, ooh, here we go. That, thank you, Larry, says Lane. You're welcome. Good night. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. Wonderful. Well, if you are in interested in future events, please visit booksincommonnw.com. We have two events coming up next week um, and looks like we're going to continue to start filling that calendar right up. Um, next week we're getting excited for Bookstore Romance Day, so we will have two panels um, from folks talking about romance books and the romance genre. Um, from there we have science fiction and literary fiction and nonfiction, so definitely join us. Keep us, stay tuned for more. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Larry, for joining us tonight and sharing the many lives of Edie Pritchard. Good night, everybody. Good night.